Hi everyone, welcome to this lightning lunch session looking at English literature. My name's Chris and I work in the outreach team at Liverpool John Moores University. The session you're about to see was actually broadcast earlier today, or the day I'm recording this. However, as sometimes happens when I watch the recording back, I found the first couple of minutes were missing. Um, so many apologies for that, but I'll try my best to get you up to speed. So this session is going to be delivered by Dr. Colin Harrison from our English Literature Department, uh, and he's going to be looking at why do Gatsby's shirts make Daisy cry? Um, if you have any questions following watching this session, you can email them to me at outreach at ljmu.ac.uk or directly to Colin at c.harrison at ljmu.ac.uk. So at this point, we'll rejoin the original recording uh, where Colin is just talking us through what kind of texts you will study uh, as an English student at Liverpool John Moores University. I hope you enjoy it. We look at a wide range of different material from um, 19th century slave narratives to contemporary novels, Native American poetry, nature writing. I'm happy to talk about um, the contents of the degree afterwards um, if you have any questions. The approach we take is similar to um, the way that I think you study literature at A-level. Um, we explore the language of a text, of course, genre, imagery, themes, that sort of thing, and um, we seek to understand the way con contexts shape the meaning of a text. So in this case, um, <coughs> tries to, um, in this case, uh, the extraordinary moment that is uh, America in the 1920s, the Jazz Age. Gatsby's published in 1925, um, so right in the middle of this decade, uh, a frenetic, um, chaotic decade of immense social and cultural change. There's a sense of liberation after the First World War, economic expansion, the skyscrapers of New York City and Chicago and other cities uh, are going up. There are greater freedoms enjoyed especially by women who get the vote in 1920. Um, and um, there's um, jazz itself, a kind of new cultural form, uh, a new form of expression for a flourishing African-American uh, community, uh, and in a sense, a new way to move, a new way to exist physically with others um, in um, dancing. Um, so a series of challenges, if you like, to social norms. Uh, now, all of this sounds very good. Of course, there is a downside. Uh, there are a new set of um, restrictions occurring in this decade, too. There are immigration laws being passed, 1921, then 1924, to severely restrict the influx of foreigners um, from um, various places, um, especially Eastern Europe, especially places of, um, of non-white um, populations. So this is the hostile environment, as we would call it today, um, for immigration. There are huge wealth inequalities, more so than, uh, than at any point in American history, even today. Um, and there is, of course, prohibition, the banning of alcohol um, in 1919, and it lasts throughout the decade until it's repealed in 1933. So this is meant to impose a kind of moral order on the nation after the war uh, with the soldiers returning back from Europe. Um, but it obviously spectacularly backfires and ends up creating a kind of, uh, well, a widespread culture of corruption, um, making the gangster a, a kind of cult hero and making organized crime the source of uh, quite a few people's wealth, including, of course, um, Gatsby himself. So Fitzgerald is, is writing novels and short stories and magazine articles throughout the 1920s. And he presents himself as a kind of chronicler of the age, um, as well as a prophet of the doom that is, um, is going to befall the nation in 1929 with the Wall Street crash and the subsequent Great Depression of the 30s. Uh, and he says this, America was going on the greatest, gaudiest spree in history, and there was going to be plenty to tell. All the stories that came into my head had a touch of disaster in them. The lovely young creatures in my novels went to ruin. The diamond mountains of my short stories blew up. In life, these things hadn't happened yet, but I was pretty sure living wasn't the reckless, careless business these people thought. So if you're studying a book, 
you will know that Fitzgerald places this picture of the 1920s alongside broader histories and myths of America. America is a place for a new uh, democratic experiment, uh, the pioneer spirit, the um, idea of the self-made man. These things are all kind of jumbled together um, under the term the American dream. And the book tries to tell, um, tries to find a way of appreciating perhaps the idealism behind that dream um, while condemning the crass pursuit of wealth and luxury. So um, <clears throat> this is a story about um, a strange, mysterious figure, Jay Gatsby, um, whose wealth is a source of mystery and whose life is dominated by the pursuit of his former love, uh, Daisy Buchanan. And it's a story told by Nick Carraway, who is a young man who moves to New York City to take up a job in banking um, and forms a friendship with Gatsby because he's his neighbour. Um, so for Nick, um, Gatsby's commitment to his dream, however absurd it is, um, is the thing that makes him a hero, this extraordinary gift for hope. So today I want to um, explore um, a different dimension of this uh, portrayal of the American dream by focusing on the ecological um, aspects of the novel, the relationship between Gatsby's dream and uh, the impact of modern America on the landscape. So this has to do with the growth of a consumer society um, that is another feature of the period, the clutter of objects that um, litter the novel, um, <clears throat> the cars, the dog accessories, um, the gadgets like the machine that can extract the juice of 200 oranges in half an hour so long as a little button is pressed 200 times by a butler's thumb. And of course, the significance of the Valley of Ashes, uh, which is this, um, this kind of region of Queens, a dumping ground um, for the uh, carbon burned to fuel New York City, looms over the novel as a reminder of the waste products of the industrial world. It's actually a real place. It's, um, um, as I say, in Queens, um, used to be called Mount Corona, somewhat sarcastically, and it's turned into parkland in the 1930s. So, <clears throat> why do Gatsby's shirts make Daisy cry? For me, this scene is, is one of the most remarkable and the most curious in the novel, really. Um, and it's given, I think, surprisingly little attention in literary criticism. It's usually read as a simple romantic climax, uh, the moment of a reunion between Gatsby and his lost love, Daisy. But I would say there's more going on here uh, and that this is where Fitzgerald is drawing our attention to the strange relationships people have with things in the modern world. So the context here is um, the first time they meet after their affair five years before in Louisville, Kentucky, uh, Gatsby goes off to war, Daisy marries Tom Buchanan instead of him, uh, and then five years later, in the present of the, of the novel, um, Gatsby um, engineers a reunion through Nick by getting Nick to invite her to tea, and they have a terribly awkward afternoon, and then they go off to Gatsby's um, mansion um, to explore it. And they end up in his bedroom, where Gatsby opens his wardrobe. He took out a pile of shirts and began throwing them, one by one, before us. Shirts of sheer linen and thick silk and fine flannel, which lost their folds as they fell and covered the table in many coloured disarray. While we admired, he brought more and the soft, rich heap mounted higher. Shirts with stripes and scrolls and plaids in coral and apple green and lavender and faint orange, with monograms of Indian blue. Suddenly, with a strained sound, Daisy bent her head into the shirts and began to cry stormily. They're such beautiful shirts, she sobbed, her voice muffled in the thick folds. It makes me sad because I've never seen such, such beautiful shirts before. Now the Baz Luhrmann film of, of 2013, which this um, image comes from, uh, it plays this straight and it even inserts a voiceover from Nick um, telling us that Daisy is sad because of their lost years. But I think this misses the, the ambiguity really of Daisy's reaction. Um, and 
I think that's clear when you read the passage in a, a larger context of the chapter and you see the way that Fitzgerald is undercutting this romance throughout. Uh, the house, first of all, is, is a kind of monstrosity. It's a weird mixture of uh, a feudal um, style and, uh, and Renaissance and, and different styles and this the kind of um, undemocratic feudalism uh, of its appearance. Uh, is noted where um, um, Mick remarks that the original owner paid for the neighbours to thatch their roofs so that he could feel some sort of lord of the manor, I mean, a fundamentally un-American um, kind of um, uh, way of living. Inside, Fitzgerald emphasises the opulence and the luxury of the place, of course, but it feels empty and useless. Uh, and Nick is somewhat creeped out by the whole affair. Gatsby, of course, is in awe of Daisy at this moment, and his sense of wonder is the key emotion in the book. Uh, but the problem is that wonder is an unsustainable emotion. This is the kind of key point I would want to make. It's always on the verge of disappearing and declining into disappointment, as you can see here. <clears throat> he had been full of the idea so long, dreamed it right through to the end. And now in the reaction, he was running down like an overwound clock. So Gatsby turns to the shirts to rid himself of this disappointment, as if the material possessions around him are capable of sustaining the wonder that has already faded. You might say that the shirts, in a sense, are a kind of fuel for his, his wonder, um, which uh, endlessly diminishes. So the shirts signify luxury, but if you look closely at the... Um, um, at the passage, you'll see that Fitzgerald is also pointing out excess, um, disorder, disarray, formlessness, the clothes that lose their form, um, and waste, you know, the soft, rich heap, uh, gently reminds us of the ash heaps of Queens. And it's at this point that Daisy bursts into tears. So, I'm saying to read it simply as a moment where Daisy's overwhelmed by regret misses the extent to which Fitzgerald is emphasizing the unsettling presence of things, the way they seem to saturate the surroundings and have a power of their own um, and perhaps operate as a kind of surrogate for human relationships. We can say this is part of a general theme in the book, uh, which is the tension between idealism and materialism, the way Gatsby rises above his sordid circumstances because of his commitment to his dream. Um, and I think Fitzgerald plays this tension very carefully. Uh, Gatsby is, is both uh, a vulgar materialist and an impossible idealist. His pink suit is, is um, kitschy and amazing. The parties he holds are brilliant and tawdry at the same time. In a sense, this is the essence of glamour, isn't it? The um, superficiality of something that twinkles, um, something which is both wonderful and empty at the same time. Fitzgerald keeps reminding us that this is a world where human values are at risk of being degraded into, um, into material values. You'll remember that um, Nick is, is um, taking up a job as a banker in, in trading in bonds. And I think Fitzgerald likes this pun on bonds. Um, Gatsby, of course, deals in stolen bonds. And that's one of the things that gets into, into trouble in the novel. Similarly, Maya Wolfsheim, um, Gatsby's partner, um, is seen to be corrupting the idea of a human connection into this business connection, um, somewhat anti-Semitically here, uh, you might say. This sense that um, human values are being corrupted into material values culminates at the end of the book where Nick imagines how Gatsby must have felt once he realizes his dream is over. So Daisy is not going to share her life with him, she's off back with Tom. Um, this is Nick reflecting on that. He must have looked up at an unfamiliar sky through frightening leaves and shivered as he found what a grotesque thing of roses and how raw the sunlight was 
upon the scarcely created grass, the new world material without being real. And for me, this is a key phrase in the book, um, material world without being a real world. Um, what remains once the world is stripped of our illusions and optimism is something that is physically present, but simply not real. Sarah Churchwell, um, the well-known um, literary critic, is good on this tension between idealism and materialism in the book. Um, she writes a history of the term, the American dream, uh, and concentrates on the 1920s and 30s and sees Fitzgerald as a key player in the emergence of the term. Um, and she argues in this book that um, it first appears as a way of talking about democratic promise, equality, justice, those sorts of things. Uh, but over time, it takes on more individualistic and more materialistic meanings associating success with wealth. Uh, and not only that, it gets entangled with um, racial ideologies uh, and isolationism um, and related to the America First movement, um, which is prominent in the 1920s. She says that Fitzgerald is ahead of the curve here um, in critiquing that slippage um, from democratic promise to brutal materialism. Um, <clears throat> he can see the dangers of that aggressive uh, wealthy class, uh, which is also a kind of white supremacist class. Here, Tom Buchanan, the kind of racist idiot in the book, is, um, is a representative of this um, populist movement. So she says Fitzgerald captures a moment when materialism is taking hold of the dream, he registered it and saw what its costs would be, the death of hope, endless disappointment, and the loss of wonder, not the realization of it. And she goes on to make the racial dimensions of this materialism ex explicit. Gatsby's famous ending describes the narrowing of the American dream from a vision of infinite human potential to an avaricious desire for the kind of power wielded by stupid white supremacist plutocrats. This is the 2018, and I think it's clear who she's thinking of. Um, it's Trump, of course, um, who is making an effort in his presidential campaign of 2015 to link the American dream with the Make, make a great, America Great Again movement. Um, fortunately, um, not to succeed for very long, although um, Trump is, is, is not dead, just gone. So I think Churchill is right, uh, Churchwell rather, I think, um, um, she's right to position Fitzgerald as a major critic of the transformation of the rhetoric of the American dream. But for me, an environmental perspective on the novel complicates that opposition between idealism and materialism. It's not so much that America has lost its way um, or that materialism corrupts the dream, but the, that the dream was always exploitative. Now I've said, that Fitzgerald emphasizes in the novel, the relation between the modern world and its waste products. In the image of the Valley of Ashes, you'll see there on the right, the dumping ground for New York's consumption, the place of the wasted lives of the laboring classes um, like um, Myrtle's husband, um, uh, Wilson. It's also there that link between the two um, in the observation that Nick makes when he travels with Gatsby into Man Manhattan over the Queensborough Bridge, reflecting on the city scene for the first time, as he says, he says to me, the, the city scene from the Queensborough Bridge is, is like the city scene for the first time. The city rising up across the river in white heaps and sugar lumps, all built with a wish out of non olfactory money. Note here, the white heaps of the city and the soft heap of the shirts semantically connected to the ash heaps of Queens. So the city seems to rise up as if by magic, but the text makes clear that there are connections, there are kind of environmental and industrial connections that Nick is missing. And I think that's a clue to the way that we can read the final um, passage. So this city seen for the first time clearly recalls the famous vision of the 
uh, green breast of the new world um, that closes the novel, where Nick um, ends the story by imagining what it must have been like um, to arrive for the first time as Europeans um, to this new world. And the inessential houses began to melt away, he imagines, until gradually I became aware of the old island that here once flowered, <coughs> that here that flowered once for Dutch sailors' eyes, a fresh green breast of the new world. So this is the passage that evokes the idealism which animates the book, the moment of wonder where sailors see a land that they imagine to be untouched. And this is the, the kind of um, famous line about, about wonder. Uh, man must have held his breath in the presence of this continent, um, compelled um, face to face for the last time in history with something commensurate to his capacity for wonder. So this is the experience of wonder that is echoed by Gatsby in his wonder at Daisy. Now, what we learn from reading the shirt scene carefully is that wonder is always momentary always doomed to disappear and likely to produce a manic reflex of grasping for material possessions. So Gatsby's materialism, materialism is not at odds with his idealism, but part of it. And he reaches out to those possessions to make himself feel better about losing his wonder. And if we apply that logic here, I think we can say that the vision of the new world is a materialistic one. Uh, the wonder will be inevitably replaced by the desire to um, possess, exploit, and of course, settle. Now, of course, this vision is fundamentally racist too, because in imagining the land as virgin land, as untouched, it, um, of course, neglects the fact that the land is already settled by the Lenape Indians. So this is the developer's vision of the new world. Um, the logic of extraction, the, the vision of a world whose resources can be exploited. Right, I'll end there. Uh, um, <coughs> here's a list of some of the sources that have helped me in making these observations and um, um, uh, they might prove useful to you as well. Um, as I've said, I'm happy to answer any questions and um, either now or following up on email, my emails at the beginning of this presentation. So I'll stop sharing and hand back over to Chris. Brilliant, thank you so much, Colin. That was um, really interesting. It's been a number of years since I read The Great Gatsby, yeah. but it's good to revisit it. Um, uh, I'm sure it'll be really useful for some of our, um, or some A-level students studying the text and, and other prospective students watching back who, uh, who have an interest in the text. Um, can I just ask, is this the sort of text that students look at on uh, say our English literature program are these the sort of things that they'd be doing as an, an LGMU student? It was, um, it, it was um, in um, about five years ago it was on uh, one of my first year modules um, called American Classics and it was simply an introduction to American literature that's taking a number of texts that um, allowed, allowed us to study um, works that had been considered great and questioning what that actually means and, and why some works are selected for that kind of accolade and at the same time exploring the cultural history that um, um, that those books uh, refer to um, so we don't do it now but we look at um, 12 years a slave which is a slave narrative by solomon northup um, and uh, use that to ask the question well what counts as literature does is it you know, is literature something that a, a supposedly illiterate slave might be able to uh, to, to write? Uh, we look at Lolita, Vladimir Nabokov's novel of 1955. We look at um, a realist novel of, of New York City, The House of Mirth um, by Edith Wharton, and we look at um, Frank O'Hara's New York poetry. So um, it's a kind of range of different material. And it looks forward to the way that we study American literature elsewhere on the degree. Well, hopefully that um, 
gives a bit of a taste of, of the program to um, our participants today. Um, if I'm just going to go back to sharing a slide myself. Um, so thank you to everyone who has joined us live or has watched this session back, whether in class, in, in school, or if you've watched it in your own time. Uh, we do hope you've found today's webinar useful. If you'd like to find out more about our lightning lunch sessions, you can find that on the website. On this slide, there is quite a, a wordy link. Um, but if you if you Google LJMU lightning lunch sessions or search for it on our website, it might be a bit easier than copying that out. Uh, we also have a new web page for students, which is our moving forward microsite. Again, you might want to search for it rather than type it out. But this has information um, such as things like how we are coping with COVID-19 uh, plans for for. 2021, 2022. Um, as we said at the beginning, any questions that you want to ask following today's session, if you watch it back at a later date, if you email us at outreach at ljmu.ac.uk, I'd be happy to try and answer them myself, uh, or if it is linked closely to the to the, uh, the subject today, I can pass those on to Colin. Uh, and, and as he said, his email address is on the first slide as well. Um, so thank you so much for watching. Um, I'll, we haven't had any live questions, so I'll bring us to a close there. Uh, but thanks for your time, Colin. I don't want to keep you any any longer. Um, and um, thanks for joining us, everyone who's watched today. Thank you.